Well, as we get started, I have to say uh, that the events of uh, this week, uh, maybe they caught you by surprise. I mean, was anybody with me, uh, you really, really thought that the nomination of a new Supreme Court justice would bring the nation together? Isn't that what we all thought, that it would just bring us all together to coalesce and be united just like our name, the United States of America? Of course, I'm speaking facetiously. No, nobody thought uh, that this would bring us together. We knew it would cause great division, uh, although many of us are surprised as to what has happened. After weeks of hearings and then one day of riveting, the whole nation gripped by what happened on Thursday on our television sets, riveting, heartbreaking, conflicting testimony from Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh. Our nation certainly remains as divided, if not more divided, than ever. At least that's the way it seems. And now the midterm elections are upon us. We're about to be inundated by television commercials and radio commercials and signs and people wanting us to you know, sign our name below this person so they can get on the ballot. And people wanting us to vote for that person and all kinds of door hangers and what not. And pretty soon after the midterm elections, <laughs> presidential candidates are going to start testing the waters and then we'll be dealing with that again for the next two years. It's hard to see our nation ever truly coming together. And you might say, man, has there ever been a political climate like this? Well, there certainly has. And when you go back to Jesus' day, we encounter religious and political groups even more divided, even more separated than what we see happening in America today. We've been talking about these religious and political groups and today we're going to finish our series, Jesus Verses. Jesus Verses. Uh, first of all, we talked about Jesus Verses, the self-righteous, highly religious group. What are they called? Pharisees. Pharisees. The Pharisees. Self-righteous, highly religious Pharisees. We talked about Jesus versus the super smart and smug and sophisticated Sadducees, part of the religious elite with political connections that we'll talk about again today. Then we talked about the extreme escapists. They were the Essenes. And just like within all of us, there might be that self-righteous little Pharisee who tends towards salvation by works and trying to do it on our own and focusing on the outward appearance and not the inner work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Just as there may be that self, that super smart, sophisticated, smug, Sadducee, uh, so also there tends to be within us that extreme escapist who just wants to retreat from the world into our cloister, who just wants to gather within the four walls of the church and have our Bible studies and have our discussions and all those things that we need to feed our faith. And yet we never do what Jesus said. We don't go. He said we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And so sometimes, like the Essenes, we focus so much on not being of the world that we retreat completely from the world and have no gospel impact upon the world, in the world, as Christ has called us to do. Last week, we considered the extremist groups uh, that make up a, what we call the zealots today. The zealots. Uh, they were willing to suffer violence for their political aims of expelling Rome from its oppression and its occupation of the land. And they were willing to enact and utilize violence to accomplish their political ends and do the things that they felt like they should be doing. So Jesus versus the zealots. And of course what they forgot is they were trying to establish their kingdom in this world. And Jesus says, my kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. He teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so for us as Christians, it is the eternal kingdom reign of Christ that we seek, not some fleeting earthly crown. And when we're tempted to get so wrapped up in politics or partisanship or those kinds of things, we ought to remember that. Today we conclude by considering the political aspirations of the Herodians. The Herodians. And we'll talk about them in just a moment. Just as has proven true in America's past, so was true in Jesus' day. Nothing, nothing brings divided people together more cohesively than a common enemy. 
So all of these different groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Herodians, they coalesced in AD 30 or 33, depending on how you date things, they coalesced against a common enemy in Judea, in Galilee. Who was that common enemy? Jesus. 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 All were allied against him. And we'll talk about a few of those stories this evening. So what do we know about the Herodians? First of all, they were a political party who supported the dynasty of King Herod. A political party who supported the dynasty of King Herod. So Herod, Ian, Herodians. Uh, that's who they were. They sought stability and support for Roman rule as a means to limit Roman interference. So they had a lot in common with the Sadducees, and they appeared to have been aligned with the Sadducees. They sought stability and support for Roman rule because they had been delegated a certain amount of authority by the Romans, but they'd also had a certain amount of authority taken over by the Romans. And so their hope was that the region would be stable enough so that Rome might say, you know what, I think the, the Herods have this. Let's just give back more authority to them. Let's move out our Roman appointed governor. That was their hope. They were closely aligned with the Sadducees. And we see this in Mark chapter 8 as compared to Matthew chapter 16. Both accounts describing the same story of a time where Jesus talks about being, being aware of, being wary of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod in Mark, and then Matthew of being aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Same story, and you might say, well, why does Mark mention the leaven of Herod and Matthew mentions the leaven of the Sadducees? Well, I believe it's because of their target audience. Matthew is talking to Jewish people who were very familiar with the religious group, the Sadducees. Mark, <coughs> writing to a Roman audience, might not be as familiar with the Sadducees, but certainly with the Herod, with Herod. And so I think what this shows us is that many of the Sadducees were a part of Herod's partisan party, the Herodians. Many Herodians were Sadducees. Just as many zealots came out of the Pharisee movement, so many Herodians came out of the Sadducee movement. Pharisees, Sadducees didn't like each other. Zealots and Herodians didn't like each other. In fact, the zealots who were among the assassin group might have even targeted some of the powerful Herodians as, as political opponents to be assassinated. They sought political stability, wanting to maintain the status quo. So the zealots were the political opposition. The Herodians are the political establishment. They want to maintain the status quo, like we said, as a means to retain power and to regain even more control of their own governing affairs. I like how the Life Application Study Bible puts it. It says, quote, The Herodians saw Jesus as a threat. Supporters of the dynasty of Herod the Great, they had lost political control when, as a result of reported unrest, Rome deposed Archelaus, the son of Herod, with authority over Judea and replaced him with a Roman governor. The Herodians feared that Jesus would cause more instability in Judea and that Rome might react by never allowing the Roman leaders to step down and be replaced by a descendant of Herod. So they opposed Jesus because they thought he was going to upset the apple cart. They thought that he was going to upset their intentions to regain the trust of Rome and a little more power and control from Rome. They opposed Jesus because he was a threat to their political ambitions. Hmm. A threat to their political ambitions. I wonder how many people in America today might find themselves in opposition to Jesus because he doesn't really match up with their political ambitions or political <laughs> perspectives. There's different views of Christians in politics. I think that Christians ought to be involved in every sphere of life as God leads as God enables. I think we certainly need Christian politicians. We need Christians in Springfield and City Hall and Washington, D.C. We need Christians in places of influence, again, as God enables and as God selects and provides. And we should pray for Christians to serve in the highest offices of our land, 
from the president and his cabinet to Congress to the United States Supreme Court to all other offices and important positions uh, to those who serve and protect here at home, to those who are aldermen, sitting on city council, the mayor. We, we ought to pray that God will raise up godly people for these positions. We know that God will do his will. It's God who raises up the leaders of the earth. But uh, many, many people, because of their own political ambitions, their plays to power, they find themselves in opposition to Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what allied the Herodians and the Zealots together. Let's consider Jesus, <coughs> go the other way, Jesus versus the Herodians. So we already saw where Jesus warned his disciples against the leaven of Herod. That means the evil, the corruption, like yeast or leaven working its way pervasively through dough. So the teachings of the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees can infiltrate our ranks, can seep into our hearts, can destroy our purity, can derail our purpose for God. Don't let yourself be derailed in purpose because of things of this world, temporary trappings of this transitory life. Don't let those things derail your purpose. Don't find yourself, you know, watching eight hours a day of cable news television, you know, trying to get the, the latest inside scoop on this or that sort of thing. We have to be really, really careful because the leaven, the yeast can seep down into our hearts and can derail God's purpose for us as Christians. Not that we shouldn't be aware or involved in politics, but we need to be very, very careful that we don't become obsessed as so many are. Let's consider the hard-heartedness of the Herodians. We encounter this in Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, one of a uh, couple of occasions where the Herodians are specifically uh, called forth. Mark chapter 3. As you're turning there, I'm sure all of you are, either on your phones or with your Bibles, right? Uh, turning to Mark chapter 3, or at least you're listening very intently. Uh, this story comes on the heels of Jesus calling Levi. What's another name for Levi? The disciple Levi. We also call him Matthew. Matthew. And what was his occupation? A tax collector. All right, Matthew's a tax collector. And then there's a question about fasting and why Jesus' disciples don't fast. Then there's a controversy about what is and is not appropriate to do on the Sabbath, especially as it relates to uh, plucking heads of grain and eating. Jesus says the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And then as was his custom in Mark 3 and verse 1, Jesus enters the synagogue and a man was there and he had a withered hand. So he's, he's crippled in his hand. And they watched Jesus and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal this man on the Sabbath. So that they might accuse him. They had insincere motives. They didn't care about this man who was a cripple. And they had a sense that Jesus was powerful enough to heal the guy. They didn't care about the man. They didn't care about the power of Jesus. What did they care about? Their own political aspirations. They wanted to get rid of Jesus and they wanted a charge to make against him. To accuse him with. Verse 3. He said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to all of them, the people that were gathered, those waiting to accuse him, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? Now that's an easy question. Let me ask you that question. Let's replace the word Sabbath with Sunday in this case. Is it lawful on Sunday to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? Okay, to do good. Do good. And to help and to save life. Of course, it's an easy question. But they were silent. I think we could picture them as being stone-faced, gritting their teeth. They were silent as they looked at Jesus. And he looked around at them with, with what? What human emotion? Anger. 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 Now, how many of you think that anger is sin? It can't be because Jesus experiences anger. He looked around at them with anger. This is a good reminder that 
Destructive anger, yes, is sin. But constructive anger, holy indignation, holy discontent, this is righteous. Righteous indignation, as we might call it. He looked at them in anger. He's livid. And he's grieved at their hardness of heart. That they would be so uncaring. And that rather than having a soft heart to the miraculous Messiah in their presence, they rather are looking for an excuse to accuse him to maintain their power and position in society. Wow. Greed at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretches out his hand, and his hand was restored. It was made whole, made right. Did they say, oh man, we're so sorry, Jesus, we were totally wrong, that's incredible, what a miracle! No. No. No, their hearts were hard. It's a good reminder when somebody's heart is hard, even a miracle right in front of them is not enough. When their hearts are hard. We've got to pray for soft hearts. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. How to destroy him. Pharisees don't usually get along with Sadducees, don't get along with Herodians. All right? And yet, what brings them together? Their mutual concern about Jesus. The Pharisees were popular amongst the people. Jesus threatened that. The Herodians had a sense of power and position. Jesus threatened that. And so they come together. They come together to try to destroy him. We're reminded of Psalm 2, verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his anointed. So, the hard-heartedness of the Herodians on display in Mark 3. The insincere hypocrisy of the Herodians on display in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. They sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. So they've been scheming for quite some time. From the year of popularity described in Mark chapter 3, now we come to Tuesday of Holy Week. So this is very close, just a couple of days before the Last Supper, before the trial, before the beating, the crucifixion. Just a few days before all of this is about to happen during Holy Week, probably on Tuesday, the Pharisees and the Herodians have been scheming together and they came up with a great question to trap Jesus as he's in Jerusalem, as the Romans are on a high alert to even the, the slightest fomenting of rebellion, they came up with a question. Maybe it took them two years to come up with this question. I'm not sure. But they knew how to trap Jesus. They came and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances. Literally, it means you do not look at people's faces. What they said about Jesus is indeed true. That you are true. Yes, he is true. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You do not care about anyone's opinion. He doesn't need to hear someone's opinion about a person because he knows the person's heart. You are not swayed by appearances. No, truly, Jesus looks past appearances straight to the heart of a person and knows the man, knows the woman immediately. You truly teach the way of God. Wow! It sounds like they want to become followers of Jesus, doesn't it? You ever met somebody who, who said all the right things, but they were just kind of buttering you up for the big zinger, for the big gotcha moment? Well, that's exactly what the Pharisees teamed up with their enemies, the Herodians, are trying to do to Jesus in the public marketplace of Jerusalem, near the temple. Wow. Okay. Knowing their hypocrisy. Well, they forgot that what they said about Jesus is true. He saw right through them. He saw right through their scheme, through what they were doing. Knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. So, what is a denarius? On one side is the portrait of the emperor Tiberius. 
On the other side, there is an inscription. So the one side is an image, which to Jewish people would be highly offensive because it goes against the second commandment. <clears throat> Some would even refuse to carry it around in their pocket or even to touch it because it was, in a sense, an image, an idol. They didn't want to have it with them. One side was the portrait of Emperor Tiberius, and the other side was the inscription in Latin, quote, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. So here we have an inscription ascribing deity to Augustus and to his son Tiberius. The coin was issued by Tiberius and was used for paying tax to him. So the whole point of the coin is for the people to use it in paying tax. Many devout Jews, like I said, refused to carry it, even in their pocket, because the image broke the second commandment, because the inscription ascribed to Caesar deity, honoring him as a false god. So Jesus says, bring me a denarius, let me look at it. And they brought one to him. Now I've always kind of skipped over that, but I think it's interesting to, to point out how readily available they had this denarius in their pocket. And maybe some of the people that were standing around watching would have seen their hypocrisy to say, well, they asked them this question, but they're carrying around this image with them. Readily available, they hand it to Jesus. And he holds it up for them and for the crowd with them. And all these interactions that Jesus has there in the temple courts, he's talking to the religious leaders of political groups, but the people are standing around listening. The court of public opinion in full force. Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Caesar's, Caesar's likeness, Caesar's inscription. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And the people marveled at him. Now here's the trap. Here's the trap. They thought they had Jesus. Should we pay taxes or not? If Jesus said, Yes, you should pay taxes. Well, then all the people would be like, Ah, what? Jesus, come on! Because he was popular with the people. And they didn't like taxes. They wanted Jesus to stand up against the taxes. And if Jesus said, Yes, you should pay the tax, the people would have been like, Ah. They didn't like to pay the tax because, number one, it was a symbol of their subjection to Rome. And to pay the tax was to submit to Roman oppression. Uh, number two, they didn't like to pay the tax because it went to not only support the emperor, but it also went to support pagan temples and the lifestyles of the rich and famous in Rome, which were highly immoral and pagan in their orientation. So they didn't want to pay the tax. If Jesus says yes, the people might turn against him. If Jesus says no... Well, the Herodians, they're going to immediately use their political connections, make sure word gets to Pilate, and say, hey, there is this popular teacher amongst the people who's fomenting a rebellion, and now he's said something treasonous in public. He said, don't pay your taxes. And Jesus would be tried, crucified, and that was their plan, to destroy Jesus. They thought they had the perfect question. Jesus sees through their plan, he sees through their hypocrisy, he holds up the coin with the image of Caesar on it, he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. In other words, it's Caesar's coin. He minted it, he put his picture on it, he wrote his idolatrous proclamation upon it, give it back to him. But, everything belongs to God. Underlying this, anyone who knows Genesis knows our scripture as well, knows that we are created in God's image. We and everything about us, everything in this world, everything belongs to God. We owe Him our all, our 100%. Everything about us is His. It all belongs to Him. Everything bears the marks of God's handiwork. You and I bear the image of God. We belong to God. He owns us. And we exist for His pleasure. And we ought to live for his purposes and his glory. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about him. So give the coin back to Caesar. Give everything to God. Live sold out for his purpose. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The people go away marveling at what Jesus has to say. Which leads to an important point here. Jesus and taxes. 
What do you think Jesus thinks about taxes? This story gives us a little insight, but also I think it, uh, it, it shows us uh, Jesus and his incredible and splendid answer. But what about Jesus and taxes? Should Christians pay taxes, even when it's not fair, even when our leaders are sinful and corrupt? The other day, uh, I went down to 230 South Dearborn. That's the street. 230 South Dearborn. Why would I go to 230 South Dearborn? What building is that? Anybody know? Famous building in Chicago. A big City hall. orange statue up front. What's that? City Hall. It's the federal building. I went to the federal building because there's a little tax issue. Basically, the IRS doesn't want to give us back our money. <laughs> so, anyway, we have some sensitive documents that we didn't really, with the way things are going now with hackers everywhere, we didn't want to email it or fax it, so we wanted to hand deliver it. So, I go in there, the guy in front of me has to take off his shoes and his belt and everything, and it's pretty high security stuff going on on Thursday at the federal building. So, I go in there, and I have to take off my watch and my belt and everything, and I make it through, everything is just fine. And then I'm really surprised because the security guard on the other side of the scanner starts chatting me up about how unfair taxes are. Oh, I'm like, and he's like, it's illegal with the government. Well, first of all, he goes, what floor are you going to? And I told him what floor is going to be. He's like, oh, taxes. <laughs> and then he starts going, it's illegal for the government to take our money. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a federal employee. You know, what's wrong with him? I'm paying your salary. So I, I, we have a little back and forth interchange, a little bit of fun. Uh, you know, and with a smile, I go up on the elevator and I go about my business. On the elevator, I realize, ah... This guy was psychologizing me. He wanted to see if there was fire in my eyes. He wanted to see how I was going to respond to this statement about taxes. He was trying to figure out if I was a bad dude with bad intent. I get what's happening here. So I hand-delivered my stuff, um, and uh, we were all set, and hopefully we'll be all set sometime very, very soon. So, uh, you know, IRS, if you're watching... Uh, let's, let's get this taken care of. I'm a, I'm a good Christian citizen. Uh, what about Jesus? Did he pay his taxes? Hmm, interesting, interesting question. Well, yes, the answer is Jesus paid his taxes. In a very unique way recorded for us, Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. Let's take a look at that together. Matthew 17, verse 24. 24, one of, one of the really unique, uh, almost quirky, incredible stories of the Gospels. Matthew 17 and verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, which in Galilee is very much Jesus' base of operations, the collectors of the two drachma tax, I believe this is the tax that was meant for uh, the temple, a uh, half-shekel offering of support for the tabernacle, later applied to the temple. Uh, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? Does your teacher not pay the tax? And Peter immediately answers without even checking in with Jesus. And he says, Yes! Yes, he pays the tax. And when they came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? I love how Peter probably runs in the house, and he's about to go into telling Jesus everything that happened, and Jesus already knows. I wonder how many times he was disappointed. Come on! So he runs in the house. What do you think, Simon, from whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax, from their sons or from others? And when he said, from others, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, then the sons are free. In other words, I'm the king of kings. And we don't need to pay this tax. All power and authority comes from me. We're citizens of heaven, we read later on in the scriptures. However, Jesus says, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open his mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So Peter, we don't really know the rest of the story, but he goes and he casts the line in. And he catches a fish, and in the fish's mouth, the tax for Jesus, the tax for Peter. Why? So that they would not provide offense to uh, the country in which they live. Now, I've never paid my taxes that way. Have you? Have any of you ever gone fishing and found a coin 
in the fish's mouth. That would be pretty exciting, right? But the point of the story for our purposes right now is that Jesus paid the tax. Notice two things here. God supplied, Jesus supplied, but Peter worked. Peter still had to listen to the instructions, silly as they were, cast a line in the water, catch the fish, look in the fish's mouth, and collect the coins. So God supplied, but Peter still did the work. And notice also how Jesus puts it. The sons are free. Yes, we are citizens of heaven. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea, cast a hook, take the fish. Not to give offense to them. It's almost as if, imagine you were a foreign ambassador for the United States in another country. And in that country, they had some traditions, some rules, some rituals that you didn't agree with. Uh, let's say that, um, you know, maybe, maybe you're a woman and your place is a foreign ambassador in Saudi Arabia. There's going to be some rules that you have to abide by to get by there. And things are getting better, I've heard, for women in Saudi Arabia. It's still pretty tough. So maybe you're forced to wear some kind of head covering or something. And you might do that. Why? So that you would not give offense to the people in the country uh, in which you were in. You're free. You don't have to do that. Your conscience isn't making you do that. Your country isn't making you do that. You're free. You don't report to them. You're not a citizen of that country. And yet, so as not to give offense. Well, the same is true in our response to government when it comes to taxes as well. So as not to give offense. So as to live peaceably with all men. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3 talks about living peaceably with all men so that we can be at peace, not fighting partisan political wars. Why? Because our focus is the gospel, spreading the gospel, living the gospel, sharing and shining the light and love of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, if you get overly caught up in partisan politics, it will impede your ability to share the gospel with people. I'm not saying that you should not be involved in politics, that you shouldn't pray, that you shouldn't talk about it. But if the way that you talk about it is uncaring and unloving and judgmental and divisive, people aren't going to hear you when you share the gospel. And which is more important, that people hear your political perspectives or that people hear the gospel? gospel. So we have, a choice. Gospel. we have a choice to make, to live peaceably and to build bridges. Because our most important task as citizens of heaven, first and foremost, is the commission Christ has given us. All power and authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. All right, Jesus paid his taxes. Romans chapter 13. Paul talks about this as well. Paul talks about this as well, and we're almost done. Romans 13, Paul says, Be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God. Those that exist have been instituted by God. And then he says in verse 6, Romans 13, verse 6, because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes, revenue to whom revenue, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And finally, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Be subject, 2 Peter 2, 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. For whose sake? The Lord's sake, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, who's the emperor in Peter's day when he writes this? Nero. We can't imagine a leader as insanely corrupt and evil as Nero. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme as to, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Many have attacked Christians throughout the years for many various false reasons. They shouldn't attack us because we're bad citizens. They shouldn't attack us because we're bad neighbors. They shouldn't attack us because we don't help or we don't care. We don't love or rude or whatever it might be why they would attack us. Put to silence the ignorance of foolish people by your lifestyle. Live as people who are free. I think Peter remembered, keenly remembered what Jesus said about the tax. The sons are free, Jesus said. Peter says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So here we have a little summary of God and government. Sorry about that. There's the verses we just looked up, Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, and 1 Timothy chapter 2. So from the Pharisees and Sadducees to Zealots and Herodians to Republicans and Democrats and everything in between and everything left and right, 
Why do you think God makes of our partisan politics and plays to power? Jesus was pretty clear. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. His basic message was repent. Turn from your sins. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He teaches us to pay our taxes, to honor our government, to pray for them as we pray to God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We maintain a dual citizenship. Our true citizenship is in heaven. And yet we are also citizens and have responsibilities as citizens here on earth. So we pray for our leaders, we respect our leaders, we register, we vote, we pray before we vote, we pray during the vote, we pray after the vote. We pray for the people who are elected even if we didn't vote for them. We abide by the laws of the land we live in. Of course, there's an asterisk there. Because if our land ever calls us to not do something Jesus has told us to do, or to do something Jesus has told us not to do, God's word is very clear. Who do we obey? The apostles were told, don't speak anymore in this name. You're causing an uproar. We won't want you to do it. Don't speak anymore in this name. You can believe it, but don't speak to the people about it. And they said, we can't. Stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Who should we obey, God or man? In that clear opposition, of course we obey God. And we accept the consequences. That's how we submit to the government while disobeying in those kinds of circumstances. We accept the consequences of our civil disobedience, if it ever comes to that. Never ever forget whose image we bear and whose commands we follow. We belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. We bear his image. We belong to him above all else and all others. We obey his voice. We follow his lead. So a lot of people are going to ask you in the next few weeks, you know, whose side are you on? Who are you going to vote for? This party, that party, this person, that person. Which team do you play for? <clears throat> Which team do you play for? Whose side are you on? And the correct answer is neither. Neither. We're on God's side. We support to, report to a higher authority, the ultimate authority. I love how Tony Evans puts it. He says, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. He wants to be king of your life and king of your heart. Let's watch this one-minute video. If we can get the lights in the back, please. A one-minute video. Uh, Tony Evans gives a great illustration from football about how this works, especially in the realm of politics. Every summer, on football fields all over this country, there's a battle between the home team and the visiting team. Two teams at war with one another. Ah, but there's also a third team. Called the team of officials. They don't belong to any team on the field. They belong to the league office of the North. They have a book that sets the guidelines for them to govern what's happening on the field of play. The players are bigger and stronger and faster. But it's the team of officials that have to be followed. The players cannot do that for the referees in which you are. You may have problems in your life that are big, fast, and keep the money over. But you also belong to the league office, to the team of officials. That means you have authority from above. You have a book that grants you that authority. You're not to join either team on the field because the league office has another agenda. Our team. As a king, when we live our lives based on his rule, we gain authority, even though we have to give the confidence all around us. Claim your authority by being part of God's kingdom. Did you catch that? We have authority given to us by God. Authority given to us by God. We have a rule book that we live by that gives us instructions on how to live. And we've been called not to join sides, but to remember that we are servants of the one true king. Mark, press escape for me, please. Servants of the one true king, King Jesus. And let me just, let me just put this out there for you right now. I wonder, you're really giving your heart to King Jesus. Have you really received him? Are you among those who Jesus comes 
and you say, hey, Jesus, you know, that's, that's great. Way to go, Jesus. And you just kind of applaud him religiously, nicely, have a nice response to Jesus because he's a nice guy. No, Jesus comes as king. He doesn't come to take sides. He doesn't come to give us our best life ever. Jesus comes to take over. Jesus comes to be our king. He wants to be king of your heart. Submit to him. Receive him. Yield to him. Admit that you fall short. Believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. Call upon the Lord for salvation. Call out to King Jesus. For the scripture says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, no exceptions, who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for what we've learned these last several weeks about the various people who opposed Jesus in his life and his ministry. God, I pray that we have learned not only historical facts, but that we've learned things that can help us interpret our current times in which we live. And all the partisans and all of the politics and all the groups and the religious groups of today and seeing in ourselves a Pharisee or a Sadducee or our tendency to want to escape and to cloister, or perhaps seeing in ourselves the, the zealotism, or the like the Herodians, the desire to hold on to power, and wrapping our lives up in politics, be it right or be it left. <clears throat> but God, Jesus didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and so I pray, I pray that we'll be good citizens, that will vote, that will express our opinions, that will do so in love, and that will always do so in Christ. Because everything we do is in love and in Christ. And that we might truly submit to him as King of kings and Lord of lords. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah.
around us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Wow. All right. Thank you all for coming tonight. God bless you. Hallelujah.